The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. We have with us today, actually before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind everybody that next Monday, Stephen Moga and Will Stacy will be talking about photography and its role in uh, documenting and rebuilding uh, New Orleans. Today's speaker is Wendy Ewald. Wendy uh, has an MIT connection. She mm -hmm. graduated from Antioch College and then came to MIT to study photography with Minor White. It was uh, a really wonderful program, legendary program. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing more about that, maybe not as part of this lecture, but... Um, Wendy has been, as you saw from the, the poster, has been working with children uh, in her photography for most of her career, and her talk tonight is titled um, Secret Games, Collaborations with Children. Uh, for her work in um, working with children in photographing their own place uh, and linking that to, uh, to education and literacy. Uh, Wendy has, is a recipient of many awards for this work, including the MacArthur Fellowship. So thank you for coming this evening, and welcome, Wendy. Thank you. All right, I'm going to sit down. And I wish I was sitting there instead of up here. But um, anyway, <clears throat> so um, I thought that what might be useful is to kind of look at, at different um, phases of my work because I have been since 1969, you know, since I was here, um, working collaboratively. And at that time, that wasn't something that um, people did. Now it's, it's somewhat of a fashion in, in, in the art world. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to start with, with the most recent project that I'm working on right now. And um, it's in Margate, England. And um, I'm also going to read little bits of things that, that, that people have said um, that I've worked with um, to give you more of a context for, for the work. Um, and this is, um, I'm going to read first something that Ali Reza, um, one of my collaborators uh, in Margate, England, said. In this short world of two days, why do you walk so proudly? Even if you become a Suleiman, in the end you will still die. I wish for the rights of all children of the world to be respected. I hope for a bright future for all children. My name is Ali Reza. I was born in Afghanistan, Ghazni. Because of problems in Afghanistan, I could not continue my life there. I really don't want to tell anything about it. There was chaos in Afghanistan. My life was in danger. I wanted to get away from all the pain I had suffered to live in a free country. So Margate um, is a seaside town, which is down at the hills, and um, it's cold. Um, it was once a grand place, um, but now there are a lot of decrepit Edwardian hotels. Um, most of them are empty and boarded up. And, um, but for the past, um, for quite a few years, um, the British Home Office has been um, housing um, asylum seekers in, in these hotels in, in Margate. Um, and um, also it's become a place for people in Britain to start their lives over again. Um, people who, who may be from Northern Ireland or who were um, fleeing a situation in, 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 of domestic violence um, because there's all this temporary housing there. Um, so um, I did a project where I worked with um, a number of, of children, um, both asylum seekers and, and, and British children, trying to look at the, the idea of asylum and the idea of starting one's life over and to expand the idea, the traditional idea of asylum. Um, and also I wanted to make present um, these people in this community who are, they're more than ignored. They're, people don't really accept that they're there. 
Um, there's a lot of tension. Um, they think that asylum seekers are getting a free ride. Um, they don't want them housed in their community. So um, I made portraits of, of each of the children I was working with, um, their faces uh, with a four by five, the, the backs of their heads, and the objects they brought with them. I also um, uh, taught them how to use um, Polaroid um, positive negative film um, to photograph their impressions of their new environment. They made maps of places they had um, come from and maps of their new home. And, um, and then I also made interviews with them. And you see along the side are, are the words that they have, they have written. Um, and then the first group we put along the, um, uh, the seawall. Um, and there were about six young people, suites of these photographs. And then in May, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and there, these, a new group of images are going to go up, but more into town. Now, one thing about doing work like this, obviously, it is very public. And um, unfortunately, after, um, while we were hanging um, this first set of images, the, um, the tube was bombed in, in London. Um, and so the situation became more, more tense. Um, and um, a week after we put up the images, um, two of them were petrol bombed. Um, uh, there was a, a suite of images of a girl from South Africa um, and her face and the back of her head were burned but the objects were, um, were left alone and the objects were her flip-flops and a copy of the Principles of Islam. Um, I also at, at, at that point um, I was uh, I linked to a National Front um, website. Um, and National Front is the fascist party in, in England. Um, and um, there were, it was lots of, all around these, there appeared fascist graffiti. So it's going to be interesting to go back now that time has passed and, um, and see what the reception of the second wave is, is going to be. Um, but um, this is a girl um, who came from the Congo, um, and she uh, and her family have um, since gone underground. Um, they, um, their appeals, their initial appeals for asylum were turned down, and they became nervous and went underground. This is uh, a boy named Yuri from Belarus. Um, and he chose his religious icons for me to photograph. And um, Yuri um, was a very uh, difficult kid to work with, very um, emotional, very uh, attached to, to me and my coworkers. Um, it was difficult to leave in the evening without a, a very squeezing hug from him. And um, when we left, um, it, was, it was very sad. Um, I worked with them for, um, for a number of weeks. And they were housed in a hotel um, that called the Nayland Rock Hotel, which was um, a place where um, T.S. Eliot wrote um, part of the wasteland, and it was the, the grand old hotel in the, in the community. Um, and um, it was an amazing place because there were people from all over the world there coming and going. Um, and some six months later, um, Yuri and his mother were um, moved. Um, they were given a house, um, an apartment. Um, in the north of England, and I went to visit him, and he was a totally transformed um, person. Um, no longer was, was he uh, clingy, and uh, he was confident, he spoke English, he was going to school, uh, he had changed his name to George, um, 
and it was an incredible transformation. Um, then a couple of months later, when I went back to England, I called his mother again, and I said, how are you? And they all have cell phones. Um, and, I, and she said, well, 50-50, um, because her English wasn't so good. And they, had been, they, they hadn't gotten one of their papers in on time. They had been removed from, from their apartment and put in a detention center. Um, and we're waiting in a, um, we're in a house in a hotel near the airport the day that I called them. And so I arranged to meet with them the next day and um, at their hotel. And when I called again, I never got them again. So I can only assume that they were deported. And this is Ali Reza. Um, from Afghanistan, and uh, he's going to school and doing fine, but not without a very difficult passage. He came out of Afghanistan by himself. He lost everybody in his family. And so initially I worked with them. They couldn't speak English, and I did interviews with them, and then by the time that I met with them again, they could speak English. So their initial interviews were translated, and then they picked um, passages that they wanted to um, place on their portraits. And um, this is Zakia's, and these are the ones that were burned. Um, she's a 10, 10 year, she's a 10 year old girl who actually lives in, in the town with, with her family. Um, they moved and settled in, in Margate. And we also, as um, part of the uh, launch of the initial images, um, the, the children worked with a, a local artist to um, create a um, and inst installations um, with their photographs and their, as you can see, their suitcases. This is Zakia's, and um, those are her flip-flops when she was little that she brought with her from South Africa, and doll, mm. her doll, et cetera. And I initially came to, uh, the first time I worked on this scale was in Richmond, Virginia. And I was invited by um, Virginia Commonwealth University um, and um, the local community that surrounds um, VCU um, to do a project. There was a series <clears throat> of um, discussions about communities in crisis. And uh, the, um, the Carver community, which is adjacent to VCU, is a very um, poor community historically. Um, while I was there, um, there was a uh, dead body found in the in the um, in the foyer. Um, there was lots of uh, uh, drug activity because '95 cut through the community, um, and um, there was a, a fire that destroyed quite a few homes that was started at VCU. Um, they were building a new building and didn't have the um, correct permits, and um, there was some problems with how they were building. And uh, so the it actually was the one of the art buildings caught on fire, and then the fire jumped over the the uh, street that separates the community from um, from VCU and burnt down quite a few of the homes. Um, my project there was to um, create these portraits in between VCU and, um, and the Carver community, um, both as, a, um, as an homage or as a, uh, to show the people in the community plus the com people outside the community who actually lived in that community. And um, the community was uh, very excited about having images of its young people um, 
this size on, on homes and on, on pieces of the university. This is on um, the home of one of the community leaders. Um, this is on, on uh, a business that is, be, is between the two communities. <coughs> So this boy has chosen as an object to represent his community his mother's yearbook and, um, and has chosen to write this on the back of his head. And this is the old Jefferson clothing store, which is right on the edge of the community. And um, Cervante chose his, his um, grandmother's African drum to represent his community. And um, I love the fact that it's on this building with the bust of Jefferson. The but for me, I had always worked inside in galleries, and this was a um, you know, a different way of collaborating with, with the community, not only collaborating um, to make the work, but also in a way that they could participate in, in the viewing of it and it could change their community. Um, these stayed up for a year and a half. Um, the community didn't want them to be taken down, and they have them now, and, and they're building a community center and they want to put them up in the community center. Um, we were worried when we put them up that they, um, they would be written on because there's a good bit of graffiti around, but that never happened and uh, sometimes people would think that the writing on the, that the kids did was actually graffiti and would call up and say, hey, you better go look at those banners. So um, people were very protective of it and then the, the community itself raised money to do um, a book as well. But it was a completely different community than the one in, in England it was a community that's in pieces. Um, this was, the African American community was united, had actually fought against the university to um, remain a residential community. So at this point, the university has to ask the community permission to move into the neighborhood. Um, and so it's, it's been a pretty, pretty successful partnership recently. And this is on the VCU parking lot. But I started uh, <clears throat> working <clears throat> in Kentucky, well I actually started working before that, but <clears throat> in um, in the early 70s um, and um, I worked in Appalachia and um, this is a self-portrait that one of my students um, took and it's called it's a picture of me with a statue behind me so anyway it's just kind of back up a little bit um, when I started <clears throat> um, working I was really interested in how people use images and what are they, what are they for um, and does that um, change actually what the images are. And when I, when I had a son um, 10 years ago and um, when he was um, going into kindergarten I um, had to um, decide, we had to decide whether he was going to go into pre-kindergarten or kindergarten. I wanted him to go into pre-kindergarten. And, um, but they asked him to make a drawing to determine whether he should, um, which kindergarten he should go in. And he made a kindergarten of a man with a heart and, and a soul. And he was, I guess he was three or four at the time. And they hadn't seen a drawing like that of a, uh, that a child that, like, that age had made. So they decided that he needed to go into the, into the kindergarten. Um, and then when he started out, um, all the rooms, and you probably have seen this, um, had little 
drawings had little cutouts uh, with each of the kids' names on them. Well, in his room, um, they had owls that were brown, and um, the names were written in black on, on these brown owls. And um, they were very difficult to read. Um, and inside the classroom, the same thing. They had cubbies with these owls high up with their names written on them. And, and for kids who were, who were just starting to read, it was impossible to um, decipher. And for kids also, I think, are, are very complex visual thinkers. Um, and when people start to um, work with kids beyond kindergarten, they really don't think much about the visual culture um, of, of childhood. Sometimes there are um, art, enrich art enrichment classes but they don't uh, uh, approach the sophistication that kids are really capable of. Um, and they see what's around them, they process it. I can remember my, my son when he was very, very little, looking, looking at an object and then looking at a, at a 2D representation of it and just being fascinated, you know, even before that he could, he could talk. Um, so really, my art has kind of grown out of certain questions that, that come out of um, that kind of thinking about that kind of representation. And I, since I've worked over 30 years in all different places, um, I've seen many different things. And so I'm, I am an artist, but my work is really in, intertwined with, with being a teacher. Um, and so that's why I I call it secret games because really it's the, the kids and I are playing are playing b visual games and and I know what they're capable of um, and um, and they they're not censoring themselves in the way that that, that adults do um, and also I was very interested about what are the distinctions between things what what is the distinction between child and adult and photographer and subject and um, documentary photography and art and um, and and in schools you know how are schools how is the education in our schools constructed um, it's largely a white middle class um, linear thinking it's tidy um, and uh, it's sort of dedicated to doing things the right way but although many of the students um, in American classrooms are, are neither white nor middle class. Um, so I, what I was interested in, in was finding ways of bringing my students' world into the classroom. Um, and the, but the pictures I began to see were not pictures that I'd seen before of, of children. Um, they are very different than, in a, quote, innocent, um, portrayals of, of children who might be adorable in middle class um, tableaus or, or victims of poverty or war. Um, and I think that these things are sort of packaged ideas of, of, of childhood. And um, that's not what, what I was seeing. And for example, this is, this is a, a photograph by Ruby Cornett. And it's a self-portrait. And it's called, I asked my sister to take a picture of me on Easter morning. And this is a picture that Freddie Childers took of, of himself. I mean, it, he probably set it up and then asked his brother or sister to actually shoot it. And it's called Self-Portrait with a Picture of My Biggest Brother Everett, who killed himself when he came back from Vietnam. And um, Freddie was six at the time. He was in first grade. Um, and um, the picture he's holding of his brother was actually when his brother was six as well. And Freddie um, went to a one-room school. It was one of two one-room one schools still left in, in Kentucky at that point. Um, and there were eight grades, and uh, the kids were working with, with Polaroid cameras, um, and we didn't have a dark room at that point because there was no place in the one room. There was just a, a, wood, a wood stove in the middle for heat. 
Um, so the first thing I would do, let me go back to this, the first thing I would do would be to ask them to make self-portraits. This is kind of, I started working there in, um, I think, 19, 1975. And I was developing a, a way of working within schools at that point. And I discovered that if you um, teach writing along with photography, that, that they'll, the teachers and schools will let you do pretty much whatever you want to do. And uh, so it was a strategy. Um, I was m much more interested in the images. I, um, and I also thought the writing could help the students focus on what they would take. Um, so they wouldn't, you know, just run off home with the camera without any idea. Well, I sort of discovered that that was actually a pretty good idea and that you could go both ways. That the kids could also write after they had the pictures because, as you know, photography is, is an art of, of detail. And um, what kids have trouble with when they're learning how to write is writing from details. Um, and also, it was a way of bringing their own homes and the things that were important to them into the classroom as subject matter. So the second thing I would ask them to do was to photograph their families, which was something they loved, <laughs> loved to do. And this uh, photograph is called Mommy and Daddy by Martha Campbell. And these kids were, um, this is from a, not from the one room school, it's, it's from a small consolidated school. Um, and these kids were um, taking Instamatic cameras home, which they were little cassette, it was 126 film, it was a wonderful film, it was a plus X film. Um, and you would, it had 12 shots in it, you'd put this cassette in the back of the Instamatic and close it up, and if another kid came along and opened the back, it was fine. Um, only the shot that, that was about to be exposed um, would be ruined. Um, and then they brought the film back into the classroom, and uh, I had built a dark room in there. It was basically a box with a, um, a plastic, black plastic top on it. Um, and they would develop and, and print. And I was fortunate to be able to work with these kids, some of these kids, for five years. Um, so I saw them from when they were in the fourth grade uh, through the eighth grade. Um, and then we, we eventually did this book together. Um, so also, another thing that was very important to these kids were animals. They were rural kids. They're, they were, um, uh, they, the animals were pets, but they were also food. And um, this picture is, is uh, called My Daddy is Measuring Our Hog um, by Joy Ingram. And um, Thanksgiving is traditionally um, butchering time, so this was um, taken in November. And one of the things that I, I I am the oldest of six kids. Um, I was around a lot of kids in Kentucky, my neighbors, and I often watched them and thought of, about um, their intense creativity when, when they're playing and uh, was wondering how I could access that photographically. Um, and um, so I kind of struck on the idea of, of asking them to photograph their dreams as kind of being a um, a way that I could I could put it that they might understand, um, and so to start off, we went in our dark room and uh, turned out the the light in there and, and told each other dreams and there were some scary dreams and uh, to create a um, an atmosphere that was um, comfortable for them to to share their dreams with each other. Um, and uh, then I asked them to make images of, of those things. And um, for some kids, it was like 
you know, just turning on the light. They they knew exactly what they wanted to do, and for other kids, it was something that was very very difficult. Um, this is um, by Alan Shepard, and it's called "I Dreamed I Killed My Best Friend Ricky Dixon," and um, Alan and Ricky had had a um, fight over um, knives. Um, they'd swap hunting knives because all these kids had um, had knives and a lot of them actually had guns too for hunting and um, they each thought the other one had tricked them so they had stopped talking and um, Alan had this dream um, about Ricky and then asked Ricky to enact it for him and in the in the making of the photograph, the two of them made up um, and continued their friendship. Um, this is by Denise Dixon, who uh, is the most talented student I've ever worked with. I don't know what has happened to her. She moved away from the mountains. And um, this is called I Am Dolly Parton. And Denise's only photographs pretty much were um, self-portraits and photographs of her twin brothers who were younger than she was. Um, but she did many self-portraits. This is another one um, called a girl, uh, The Girl with the Snake Around Her. I am the girl with the snake around her, her neck. And I don't know if you guys know who Cindy Sherman is. Do you know who she is? Well, I always say that Denise did these before Cindy Sherman <laughs> did her pictures. <laughs> Only Denise really, I, they're mo more moving to me because Denise really believes she's those people in, the, in that moment. Um, and this is another one of her pictures, of, and it's called um, Philip and Jamie are creatures from outer space in their spaceship. And. Um, she worked very hard to uh, create the effects that she wanted. There's nothing um, unintentional about any of this. Um, and uh, you can see if you look at, at her contact sheets, um, she experimented with a lot of different materials before she got the stockings right to get that, that look. Um, and um, she made some long, very long, complicated dreams, too. Um, and we had an exhibition at the University of Kentucky. Um, we had many exhibitions. We had one in the International Center of Photography in, uh, in Chicago. And, um, but the, the one at the uh, University of Kentucky, um, we took most of the kids. And Denise's mother came as well, because she was very proud of Denise's photography. Um, and um, during the opening, she stood next to that picture the whole time to tell anyone who looked at it that her kids really didn't look that way. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's something, I knew that there was something about these pictures that I hadn't seen in, in other photographs um, before. Um, either photographs of, of Appalachia or actually earlier I worked in Canada. Um, they, they were different than documentary pictures. Um, and uh, it's interesting now, um, I'm starting to get, because of the internet, get back in touch with a lot of these people who are now in, in their 40s. And um, it's uh, interesting to hear you know, what, what that kind of meant to them or, or how it fit into their, um, into their lives. And we're about to reprint the book, which, which was now 25 years ago, I guess, that we did it. Um, and then I, I went to, I did lots of things, but, but I went to India um, in the early 90s. Um, and um, for me, that was a very important experience because I, I lived in a village um, in Gujarat. Um, and um, I worked with kids. 20 kids in that village. Um, and those kids didn't have any pictures. Nobody in the village had any pictures. There were no newspapers with pictures. There were no books with pictures. Um, there were no snapshots. Um, the images that there were were um, laminated um, 
colorful laminated pictures of the gods um, that were on their houses. And um, so when I started working, um, I had to, everybody wanted to be involved. And I was working with a, um, a local organization and, um, and the elders in the village said that they thought that I should um, create a, um, a kind of test to see who should, who should be in the class. And uh, so I asked each one of, of the kids what they wanted to take pictures of, um, why they wanted to take pictures, and to look through my camera and tell me what they could see. And what I started discovering um, was that they all said they wanted to photograph the gods. And um, so I was really perplexed, and as, as were the people from the community who, not from the community, but from the organization who were working with me. And finally we said, okay, well, so what is a photo? And, um, which was the word that was being used in Gujarati, and um, they showed us the laminated pictures of the gods. So what I had to do, um, which was such a privilege to be able to do, was to, was to tell them, to show them what a camera could do. And um, I had, fortunately had Polaroid positive negative film. So I, could, I took a picture of each one of them um, and showed them the negative and gave them the, the print. Um, and I just asked each one of them to sit how they wanted to sit. So I did a whole series of pictures of them and it was the first time they'd looked at a camera and the first time you know, the camera had, had looked at them. And I was just doing it as a teaching tool. Um, but then later on I realized that there was a kind of power to, um, to the images um, because of that you know, first intense gaze. And so I used them in a, in, subsequently in a book that I did um, and then I paired, paired them with uh, interviews I did with the kids um, at the end of the project. Um, and this is Hasmoop, one of the kids, and I'll just read you a little tiny bit of, of uh, I think, if I can find it, of, of one. Uh, because it also, context became very important for these images. Um, I, you know, needed to explain really who these kids were. Not that just that they were taking pictures, but who they were was as important as, as what they were taking pictures of. Um, so he's 14 and uh, a member of the farmer cast. And he says, I got married two months ago. It was a nice day. We all went to my wife's village on a tractor. No one danced, but people sang. I enjoyed it. I married Gali from Vasna near Doda. My sister married a fellow from Vasna, and when we visit, I'd see Gali fetching water. I had no idea that I would marry her, but she knew. I didn't even know her name. When I got engaged, Gali's relatives came here to the village. Her father brought me a turban, a letter, and a piece of paper. Then he put a coconut in my hand and brought me a bowl of butter to drink. Her father's a rich man, so she brought lots of money and gold ornaments with her. Gali wears village skirts and saris. She's tall. Maybe I'll grow to be a tall fellow like her, but short boys get married too. She's 13 and I am 14. I like her. She's good natured and good looking. I took four or five pictures of her standing by the door. I'd like to bring her to photography class, but she'll feel shy. She doesn't fight with me. She always re respects me, and when she doesn't, I'll send her away. Eventually, I'll go to my father-in-law's place to live. They have a scooter and two cycles over there. I'll need a kid also. I want only one son, no both, a son and a daughter. I'll name the boy Mahesh and the girl Wendy. I don't have any brothers and sisters at home, so I like it when she comes to say, I have three sisters, but they are married. One brother died in an accident and one drowned. He was a lame fellow. Neither of his legs worked. When he walked to the fields on crutches, he always passed a dump. One day it was filled with water, and he fell into it and drowned. I dream about my brothers that died, so at night I cover myself with a blanket to keep away the dreams. When my heart beats, the dream comes out. It shouts from the whole body, I'm coming out, 
and then it comes out. On Diwali, I dreamed that I went up to the sun in a balloon. I saw two goats standing on the edge of the sun, and they tried to butt me away. We are all dreaming, but in the morning when we open our eyes, the dreams are all gone. Last night, I dreamed I had a girl in my pocket. So the, the form of the book also became very important to me as, as a way of, um, of contextualizing um, the images. Um, and there on the left, you see one of the photos. And, uh, and then I wrote about the experience of, of working together. Um, and um, each of the sections was, uh, was divided by, by prayers um, that were um, used in the process of working together. And, and this, is, um, this is a prayer which was recited at the dedication of the darkroom, because we built a darkroom. Um, there were only mud houses, so we, um, we built a, a, a cinder block darkroom with a tin roof. Um, uh, in the barber's front yard. The barber was one of the village elders, and um, he um, agreed to let us have the, that piece of land for 10 years, rent-free, if at the end of the 10 years um, he could have the building. And um, so it was, a, it was a big day when, when the dark room was, op was opened, and um, it was lots of um, ceremony and speeches, and, and this was this was part of it. And another thing that was it was quite remarkable about these kids is I, it was very difficult for them to photograph there because everybody wanted their photograph to be taken, and um, so it was hard for them to isolate the figure or isolate something. Um, and um, so towards the end of the project. Um, they spontaneously, some of the kids, started cutting up the images. Um, and um, this is the result of, of one of those projects. But they, they used everything, every bit of the, the process, the, uh, the paper that, that, um, that wrapped around the film, the box, um, the leader. Um, and uh, I got books um, with archival paper um, from Gandhi's ashram for, for them to, to work on. Um, so it, it, it was a case of sort of following where they wanted to go. Um, and then eventually when I did do this book, which is called I Dreamed I Had a Girl in My Pocket, um, there was a section of my photographs, a section of their photographs. Um, so it was really about this collaboration. It was about the village, but it was all, also about how we had worked together. Um, and so the, the picture on the right is my picture. The picture on the left is um, uh, Sajan's picture. And um, she's photographed the wedding of the girl whose face is cut off in the front and the boy in the center of the picture. And so they, I um, just want to say one more thing. One of the great things about working with them is that they really, um, believed strongly that making an image was giving respect. And um, so every piece of the process also, they related to that. And when they developed film, when they would agitate the film, they would pray because it reminded them of, of, the, of the ardi, which is part, part of the, the prayer ceremony. And um, in the darkroom, we had a, a a uh, bulb that we painted red for our safe light, and um, they called that God's bulb. Um, but it was it was a privilege for me to get to understand photography f through their eyes and to have to explain it from um, from the basic viewpoint of making of giving respect by making an image. Hmm. And then I went to um, Polaroid, sent me to Mexico. Um, and um, to do um, create an exhibition, um, and I this was um, this actually I think was in '92, and um, I worked in um, 
four different communities, two indigenous, indigenous communities and two um, Ladino or, or two communities of Spanish descent um, in Chiapas. And it was the year before the, um, the um, revolt in Chiapas. Um, and uh, it was the first time I, I asked kids actually to use positive negative film. I thought it would be something that would be very difficult because with these cameras you have to um, measure the distance and um, you know you can't see it and uh, also they had to carry a, a bucket of sodium sulfite with them when they shot to put the negatives in it was pretty com complicated um, what I found however is that's a great thing to do because the kids had to work hard to um, learn how to command the material and um, they were certainly up to it and it slowed their process down so they could think about what it was that they were going to do. Um, this is a photograph by Juan Jesus Murillo and um, it's called Here is My Cousin Miri with the Skulls and Fruit for the Day of the Dead. I always have asked the kids to make titles for their pictures um, with the idea that these photographs are going to be seen by people and then if you um, make um, any kind of verbal context for a photograph um, then you can direct people to what it is that you want them to see to further give them control over over the image um, and Juan Jesus is actually um, one of the better photographers and he was blind in one eye and had a hard time seeing out of the other eye. And um, he said what he really liked about taking pictures was that when kids would talk about experiences that they'd had together, they would always say, oh, you remember when we saw that? Oh, you remember that guy? You remember what he looked like? And those weren't things he could, those weren't common memories he could have because he didn't see the same things. And so, um, by having the photographs, he could go back and talk with his friends and also look closely and see some of the things that they, that they were seeing. And this is by Teresa Lopez called My Dog Walking in the Patio. And of course, every different camera, different kind of film um, affected the, the process affected the, the, the photographs, but also the process of working together. Um, this is by Nicasio Perez, and it's called My Sister is Braiding Her Hair. And this is by Vladimir Stalin Besabil Vargas, and it's called The Hens Are Going Into the Kitchen. So here again, but, uh, animals. Um, this one is called My Sister Carrying the Water. And it's by Luis Hernandez Gomez. And for a lot of these kids, they didn't have any photographs. They never had any photographs. This is one of my favorite photographs of all times, I think. And it's by Sebastian Gomez Hernandez, and it's called The Devil is Spying on the Girls. And I have no idea how he was able to make that, you know, how the kid got, because I wasn't there, you know, when these were made, um, how the kid got up there. Um, but um, in Mayan culture, um, dreams are extremely important. Um, whatever happens in, in a dream is considered as real as waking reality. Um, so when I asked, when I let them know that we would be, um, I would be asking them to, to photograph dreams, they were very excited. And all I had to say is fantasias. And, and uh, the next day they, they arrived with um, masks that they had made. And this is one of the masks. They didn't have any materials, so the, the masks were made from the back of cracker boxes. Um, and they're you know beautiful masks and 
But I said, well, you know, why did you um, make the horns coming out of the, the jaw? Why, why didn't they come out of the, you know, the top of the head? And he said, oh, I don't know. It just looked good to me that way. Um, and then later, um, I was actually sharing a, um, a house with an anthropologist. And um, she pointed out to me images in the Mayan glyphs where the, these things of that shape come out of the jaws. And then I began to think about, well, you know, where do these ideas come from? They, um, they are embedded in the, visual ideas are embedded in the culture. Um, and uh, anything that, that, that a child comes up with is for a reason. Um, Um, this is uh, called Wolfman and His Enemy by Javier Bautista. And these kids went to great lengths to, to make their dream photographs realistic. You know, and they're use also using a very difficult process where they're measuring the distance and they got to hold it steady and... Um, This is called um, Sebastián was punished for eight hours by Dominga González Castellanos. Um, and, you know, she could have gotten the point across by putting a couple of runs of rope around him, but that's not what she wanted to do. And usually when kids see this, they, they won't believe that it's not real. So um, I did many other things, but another um, experience which was very important to me was, was working in Saudi Arabia, um, which I did in 1997. Um, I, at a certain point, I, be, I became very interested in how people see, Im see photographic images in different cultures and different countries in the world, so I was sort of uh, trying to go to as many different kinds of places. And I was very interested in working in um, the Muslim world. And I, I worked in, uh, in Morocco um, for, um, I guess, in 1995. Um, and uh, it, was, um, it was a wonderful experience, but it was quite difficult. Um, I made some mistakes. Um, I asked the kids to photograph their families, first of all, because I thought that would be where they would be most comfortable. And they let me know later that that was not what I should have done. What they said they wanted to photograph were monuments. And I didn't understand what they meant by monuments. And I thought, oh, that's a very unkid-like idea. It's, it's a received idea from the culture. And um, um, you know, they, they need to loosen up and be more playful. Those are my stereotypical ideas. Um, and in fact, that's probably what they should have done to, to begin with. Um, I also asked them to photograph in, in the commu their community. And uh, everyone assured me that was fine, you know, that there would be no problems, they could do it. And the photographs came back all blurry and I couldn't figure out why because I knew that they were very, you know, skillful. And um, in fact, there had been a catastrophe out on the street and people were yelling at them, throwing rocks at them. They were trying to trick people. They were up for it. They were very, you know, that didn't bother them. Um, but I felt horrible. Um, and so I finally had, I finally got the translator that I was working with to, um, to, for, for all of us to have a discussion which I could tape so that I could actually get it trans, translated uh, word by word so that I would know exactly what was going on so people weren't trying to be nice to me and saying that there was no problem. Um, so um, one of the people I met when I was in, in Morocco was uh, um, the cultural attaché because in order to do all this work I had to bring cameras and film and everything through customs. I don't know that I, I, I could do it anymore, really. Um, so I would get the diplomatic pouch 
um, somehow or another. And um, so the, the woman who was in Morocco who helped me out was then stationed in Saudi Arabia and said, wrote me and said, well, you know, would you come work with women and girls? And um, so I said, sure. And it was very difficult to get a visa. Um, I was going with my, my husband and my son, and that wasn't, they weren't happy about that, that I was the primary worker. Um, and, uh, and also the fact that women were going to make photographs um, was uh, problematic. There is a house, uh, something called the House of Photography, though, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and there's a men's group and a women's group. And so they, um, the women's group asked to have a, a woman photographer come <clears throat> and work with them. So uh, I decided to ask them to make self-portraits and photograph their dreams because it was something that they could do um, within um, within their families, they wouldn't have to go out. Um, and um, this is one of those um, self-portraits. Um, they, in order to uh, show them publicly, of course, they couldn't have their faces in them. So um, she's used the chair to obscure her face. And uh, it's by, um, it's a, a series uh, um, called Who Am I, 1970 to 1997. Um, and um, so I think there were about a dozen images. And um, she's uh, looking at different books in, which represent different par parts and stages in her life and then has placed different objects next to her. Um, And these were all taken with Instamatics, I mean with um, point and shoots. Um, Kodak had um, donated the film and processing. They, I, they were interested in creating a market in, in Saudi Arabia, so I had to meet with the Kodak executives while I was there. Um, so I also wanted to photograph them. And um, this is one of the pictures that I, that I made. Um, and we negotiated quite early on how to make these pictures so that they could be published. It was very important that, that they be published. Um, and um, this is also Nadine, but this is how Nadine wanted me to photograph her by photographing her daughter. And, um, and I suggested she add her hands. Um, and I had started, actually in India, um, giving the, um, the black and white large format negatives to the people who were in them uh, to alter in any way that they wanted to do, to do it, um, to um, sort of lay there, even if I made an image, that they, that they um, laid claim to that image by putting their own marks on the negative. Um, so this is what she wrote, um, and I don't know what the, what the Arabic is, but the English says, when I were a lady. Um, and one of the women that I was fortunate to work with was a, a writer named Raja Alem, um, who's continued to be a, a, a great friend and correspondent. And um, she's actually a well-known writer in, in the um, Arab world. Um, and uh, this is um, a picture of her holding the Book of Dreams. Um, and then she wrote on her abaya all around. I don't know if I have what she wrote. Um, but when these were first published, I asked her to write a piece to uh, accompany them. Now I'll just read you a little bit of it. Um, in this case, photography turned out to be something more. It began when we allowed an outsider to see behind the veil. Then, assuming the role of hunters put us in another realm and gave us a place to stand that was powerful enough to alter the male-controlled orbits we move in. 
When we took our cameras into the street, people reacted with sincerity and entertained new possibilities. The bodies they had lived in so long opened to whatever experiences they might encounter. They seemed oblivious to the dangers of intrusion or captivity. They opened up and posed happily, smiling at the camera's charm and at our courage in openly pursuing stories in circumstances that are ordinarily closed. By posing, they allowed us to steal their souls. And in the very act of announcing our power, we women gained power over the men. And this is a picture that, that Raja took of, of herself. And it, it was great working with these women. Um, they had never, uh, I think there was one woman who was a photographer, but everyone else had never taken pictures. Um, you know, including Raja, and they, I worked with them in really very similar ways to how I worked with children. Um, this is another one of her pictures, and it's called Twin Sisters. So they had to find symbols in a lot of ways to represent themselves, which was very interesting. This is her actual sister, um, Shadia, who's a painter. And um, it says, I used to dream my paintings before, but now they dream me, I think. And um, Shadia um, came to me to be photographed with um, markings that, drawings that she had put on her face. And then when I gave her the negative, then she added this second layer of, of drawings. Um, and. Um, these look, as silver prints, they're you know, like 50 by 50 inches by 60 inches, inches and they're, they're pretty incredible and they have this sort of depth to them because of the different layers of markings. And we decided um, to have an exhibition pretty early on. I only could work, I only could get a visa to be there for two weeks, so we did everything in, in two weeks. <laughs> And, um, but we decided to have an exhibition in Saudi Arabia. There had never been any photographs shown before by women. And um, so we had to decide um, who it was going to be for. Um, because if it was going to be for just women, then they could use any of the pictures they had. Um, but they decided they wanted it to be for um, for a complete audience. And so then we had to begin the process of, of, um, of deciding what we could use and what we couldn't use. And that was actually pretty painful. Um, well, probably more for me because I wasn't used to it. Um, and also for some of the younger girls um, who were told that they couldn't use certain pictures. Um, so, um, for example, this didn't get used, but um, um, but this one did. Um, and this is um, by one of the, uh, uh, I took it, of, of Joanna holding her little sister. And um, her little sister is younger um, than seven or eight, which is about the time when their faces start having to be covered. And, uh, but Joanna put that beautiful veil marking all on her and, and everything except for her little sister. Um, but when it came time to um, publish it, she asked me to add more lines to her face to further protect her face. And it was actually very difficult for me to do, but I did it. Um, and this is um, by the one photographer in the, in the group, Noah Khalib, um, and it's called Sleeping With My Shoes. And it's a, it's a dream image. Um, so the first night, we, um, there were three openings. Um, and I actually wasn't there, but they all called me um, from, from the opening. Um, the first night was for women. The second night was for men. And the third night was for families. And they did a catalog. And one of the princesses sponsored it. And this is called Crying for My Face also by Noha, which I think symbolically is such a wonderful image.
And just I'll go quickly through some of these um, later things when I started working on specific issues. And this was at a time when uh, in Durham, North Carolina, where I've worked a lot, um, when two school systems were merging and African American kids and white kids were going to be going to school for the first time and there was a lot of trepidation. So I designed a project that I thought would be educationally interesting plus conceptually. Um, and so I asked them to write about themselves as, write a self-portrait and then write another one as if they were a member of the other race. And so this is a, a kid, Damien Barnett, um, who's African American and he's written I'm light skinned and have black hair, etc. as his himself and then as as white Brent. He says, I am eleven years old, I'm the only child, my name is Brent, I go swimming, etc. And then I asked them to bring things from home so that they could pro pose as each of their selves. So and on the left he is a, a white only child, and on the right, he's himself. And this is Antonio Gunter, um, who's imagined himself as white, as being homeless. And uh, when I was able to talk to him about it, after we made the pictures, he said that he imagined uh, being white was to not have a community in the way that he had a community as an African American. And this is Heather, who's imagining herself as jumping rope as an African American, and reading as, as a white um, girl. And all of the reading photographs were white, whether they were by African Americans or whether they were by whites in the beginning when I started doing this. And uh, then after the merger, um, things changed because this was done for many years. I, other people did it as well as, as I did it. And this is an African American boy, Gregory Blake, imagining to be white is to be aggressive. So he added I, all those lines, all those beautiful lines. Um, he posed, I took the picture, and then he. And this is um, Xavier Vereen. And I'll just read you this, this is really short. Okay. He says about himself, I am silly, have dark brown hair, I'm scared of snakes, I like dancing and singing. Five, I like to swim. Six, I like track and field. Seven, I like to talk on the phone. Eight, I like to play with my dog. Nine, my favorite team is North Carolina. Ten, my favorite food is pizza. Um, if I was white, one, I will change my name to Jonathan on family matters. Two, people will call me a saltine. Three, I will be a rock star on stage. Four, I will stay in school. Five, going to funerals will be different. And six, I would like going to Greek restaurants. And that's Brandy Bishop imagining she's a white girl, imagining she's an African-American princess with her castle behind her. And this is finally when things began to change after a couple of years of, of merger. And now this is a project that um, the, at University of North Carolina is a big teacher training program and the teaching fellows do, do this project um, as they, before they get their certification. And then lastly, I, the last book I did is called American Alphabets and it's uh, looking at what uh, America is through language and uh, there's four, it includes four different alphabets um, uh, Arabic, uh, Spanish, um, English, um, white girls and English um, African American middle school students um, and this, the, the white girls were done at Andover and they chose the words and I made the pictures but with Polaroid and them directing me and then and then they they chose the color backgrounds and uh, wrote the letters and the words 
and then also there in included um, they wrote definitions their own definitions for the words and um, sentences using the words and uh, this is the Arabic alphabet um, which I did on um, on silk that you can digitally on silk that you can see through and it's at the this is an installation at the Queen's Museum um, and I worked with um, with middle school students in um, in Queens, and this is the word um, amar, uh, which means to command. And this is the word neighbor, jim. And this was. Um, the installation opened um, right before the Iraqi war started, and um, we had Arab Family Day, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful day. Um, the, lots of people from the community and the parents were there, and they all talked underneath the banners about what it meant to them to see their, their language um, monumentalized in, in that way, and respected in that way. And uh, this is shem or smell, and they had to figure out how to use um, these markers are also on the negative. So they had to figure out how to use, you know, a yellow marker to, you know, create blue, et cetera. So it's quite complicated. This is uh, diminish, um, which I thought was a great one. And this is kitab or book. And this is the first time these kids had never been together as a group before. And uh, it was something they were very pleased about. And this is the school lunch. Sorry, it's backwards. And that's it. That's the slides. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, um, well, in, in um, Richmond, um, it was a com combination. Um, I talked to the kids about where they wanted them. And um, um, one of the, the big sites they really wanted was, uh, was Kroger's, because um, there was a new Kroger's, and also VCU. And we did those. Um, but there were also other sites that we did use, and and there were um, people in the community that wanted them on their houses. So the one you saw in the house, there were, there were two community leaders um, that definitely wanted them on their houses, um, two older women, and, and we used those. And then there were some other, then we got into the idea of like, where was this walk going to go? Um, and so we identified some other buildings that it would make sense, um, you know, to to use. Um, but I think the core of them, the majority of them, were ones that people wanted. Um, and then there were like three different maybe businesses, three or four businesses that we asked um, if we could. And who did those negotiations? Oh, it. Um, no, no, it was um, it was the. Um, the leaders of the community group and the um, contemporary art space that I was working with who did that. Yeah, I wish that the kids had been more involved in that um, because they were in, in school also it was difficult to do that um, and even when they went up um, they weren't there when they went up um, 
so I made sure that in Margate they were they were there when when they went up and and also we went around and they you know said where they wanted things and um, so um, you know that was much better but I, the, when I was doing it in Richmond I really sort of didn't know what I was doing the, or how it was going to go and it was quite it was quite scary actually um, doing it the first time and I was worried about the kids how were the kids going to feel um, and uh, you know not having them there with me I, it was difficult but um, in in fact they all loved it and they brought their families there and it, it was um, and then they also began to get nicknames based on their building um, so there's one of the girls was called Kroger <laughs> Um, but there was a there was a really difficult moment um, in in the beginning because the first site we put up um, one of the girls had written um, I my grandma likes African stuff and I think there was a, there was an African mask that that she used and uh, someone um, as soon as we put it up someone first of all thought that they were ads, which I sort of was interested in, that idea, that they did sort of look almost like ads, or you could think that, but they weren't. And, uh, and then when this person found out, well, no, that they, it wasn't an ad, but that it came, actually came from the community, um, he was incensed over the word stuff, that it was disrespectful. And, uh, and that sort of he he led a sort of campaign about this and and uh, and there was another image uh, where a girl had written about her community and she had written she had written it as a, as a poem but it was in dialect I guess and and so then he seized upon that and how that was disrespectful and um, and he threatened the school and um, the principal said you know deal with it. <laughs> And uh, so the, the community leaders um, got different factions together, including him and people from the school, and they held a prayer meeting um, to pray for the success of the meeting. And then, and then we talked with them. And it, 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 was, it was really difficult. And then finally I said, well, have you ever read Toni Morrison? You know, you know how you know, she writes and how she uses language. And that, helped him understand that it was all right for a child to write, you know, use their own self-expression in, in that way. And, but that was the one problem that we... It's interesting because those are such intimate portraits in such public places. I know. I know. I know. I was terrified. I was really... I, I hadn't understood... I mean, I understood it, but, you know, when you are involved in something, it, you see it. I mean, I, I was by myself when they were sort of coming down, but... Yeah, yeah. Did you have um, uh, an exhibition in Mexico and in India? And if so, can you talk more about the community reaction? As well as Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, the men's day versus yeah. the women's versus the families. Can you talk yeah. about what the community response was? Yeah, yeah. In India, it was, uh, we, we had one in, um, in the school, which was uh, two two rooms but there was nothing in the rooms so there was a dirt floor and so um, I um, strung clotheslines up and um, the, we got some cardboard and the kids pasted their pictures on the cardboard and then they wrote titles on them and then we used um, clothespins and hung them from the, from the clothespins and um, it was a huge thing um, People came from all, villages around. Um, people wore ceremonial dress. I had to wear a sari. Um, I mean, I wish all my openings were like that. It was. I thought they were going to break down the door before we got it up. Um, it was. It was so much excitement, and um, you know, officials gave speeches. Um, it was a big. It was a big, big thing. Um, and uh, in Mexico, we did have one in, in the town. In Mexico, it was more problematic because um, uh, Polaroid in Mexico 
was unhappy about the fact that I worked in, in Chiapas with um, indigenous people. And although they loved the pictures, and um, they didn't want them to be shown in, in Mexico, because they didn't want to be associated. Um, and um, so anyway, that, so, so there was actually, it was an exhibition that went to many places in, in this country. Um, and it, it's been shown in the community, but it's never been shown in a, in a museum in Mexico, which I think is a shame. Um, but um, but that's not Polaroid's fault here. <laughs> it, um, and uh, yeah, it, it was also during a time when um, when Mexico had had um, given Polaroid a huge order um, to make the the machines for to clean up the voting registration. Um, so it was, you know, politically they thought that they were doing something nice for, for Mexico by sending me there, and then I did something that was, you know, politically incorrect as far as they were concerned. But I do always have, um, you know, exhibitions in, in, in the community, um, but that one in India I think was my favorite. In your, in your Durham project, um, photography and literacy, did you see any impact in it? been there over the years. Have you seen any impact on the place itself through the photography? Well, I think, you know, that's somebody that, something that would be great if somebody actually looked into, because it has been, it has been like at least 15 years. <clears throat> and we have an archive, for example, I, I guess actually since 1989, we have an archive of, of uh, children's work, um, you know, every year. Um, and um, uh, there are some of the schools that we've worked in who, who've actually um, centered their pedagogy ar around the idea of making pictures and, and, and bringing the home lives into the classroom. Um, but, you know, it, no, no one's ever kind of studied it, but uh, it, it is a lot of kids have, have, uh, have had experience in, in different grade levels. In Kentucky, yeah. What are what are they? Have any of them pursued photography? No, or? no, I've never found out found anybody who who has, which is, uh, which makes complete sense to me. I mean, it's never been something, you know, I've been that interested in. I mean, I just think it's, you know, it photography is this great medium that you don't need hand-eye coordination that you do for drawing or you know music, and so. Um, Kids can really um, learn it quickly and 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 use it to its full potential, um, but um, there uh, people have been getting in, in actually in touch in touch with me, and there've been a series of meetings actually, um, um, which is great timing for me because I I really want to see what they're doing and and write another piece when we reprint this book, um, but uh, one of the the people is now a um, uh, high school principal, and um, she was interviewed recently. I mean, I've emailed her, but but you know, she's emailed me. But um, and um, she uses uh, photography in her teaching, um, and um, um, she says that that um, you know during the doing the work that we did sort of allowed her to think that she could go beyond um, what she thought was going to be the life for her. Um, because actually when I stopped working with the kids, um, it was another, it took me five years to find a publisher to publish this, this first book. Um, but I was very discouraged when I stopped working with them because I, I thought that as soon as they hit puberty, this sort of potential that they that they'd had as as photographers as creative uh, beings was was over because for a lot of them um, like Denise she really stopped taking pictures when she got in eighth grade and and I 
it was really difficult for me, and she knew it was difficult for me, and so it was embarrassing. And um, but uh, in fact, I found out that um, through contact later that that actually these kids didn't. Um, do what I had anticipated, which would be that the girls would have been housewives and the, the guys would have been coal miners, that their lives were a lot more varied and, and quite a few of them went to university. Um, one of them uh, went to graduate school at UNC. And, um, so it was interesting to, to see. And I, I'm, I'm hoping actually to go back this summer when they have another one of these uh, meetings where they bring together the, the people who are now, you know, in their forties. I can't imagine it. And uh, and I think um, my ten-year-old son has agreed to uh, film it. So it should be interesting. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. You already mentioned about somebody mistaking a photograph for an advertisement or something. What would you think of? of putting these up in, in extremely sort of urban metropolitan environments which are proliferated, you know. All the images. images, right? Yeah. And then it's so easy because of so many sort of things like them being black and white, also because of, of advertising photography, apprehending these things like Benetton. Mm -hmm. And then there is this blur of whether you can recognize something as, as coming from uh, our community of real experience as opposed to something that is just, you know, taken up by another form. Right. Just used for purely aesthetic purposes. But what, what are your thoughts on, because what then happens is that it, it kind of diminishes the possibility of downtown city centers as being these museum spaces. I think it's great to do that. I mean, that's really why I wanted to do that. Uh, that's why I made them in black and white, so that they would be different. Um, and um, um, and I think, and I also wanted them to, to look a little bit like ads, so that you sort of, you know, you, ha you looked at them and then, and then you had to look again. I think that would be fine. I think it depends on how you make the images. Um, I mean, something like these are very simple, so they're not actually what ads look like. And, and the technology, well, if you get up close to these, um, you can see all the pores in the skin, you know, because they're shot with four by five, and um, so, so that they actually look like you're looking at somebody, they don't look like an ad. And I think it would be very interesting. Do you have any sort of what? plans of creating them to something? Um, yeah. No, I'd love to do that. No, I don't have any plans at the moment. Somebody has to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the other difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my other question was, uh, I'm so happy. Um, you mentioned that uh, you were talking about how when you were growing up, there's a lapse. Which raises the question, obviously, cognitive scientists look at it, but you're working with children, you consistently have been about the nature of creativity. I mean, how much of this is innocent thought, something that every human being possesses, and then there is something that transitions into adult mm -hmm. and makes an artist. I mm -hmm. just put it very simply. Mm -hmm. Can you, is it possible to sense it in children? Well, I mean, I... Such that can, you, can you tell this will not lapse at puberty? No. But, but I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, we're used to thinking about this in music, right? In, but we're not um, used to it. I mean, maybe Picasso. You know, if you, you see Picasso's early drawings, and you know, they're they are incredible. Yeah, but particularly with photography, because there's it's yes, because you can do it. Anybody can do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, something I would love to find Denise someday and to see what's. What's the last thing I knew that she became a nurse practitioner, but the thing is with with her, I could tell from the first roll of film that she had a distinctive sense of of composition, and it was consistent, um, you know, for four years anyway until until she stopped. And there were other kids that that was true for, as well. Um, and and I think that the reason why she stopped was because there was nothing in her culture 
um, that would lead her to think that she should become a, a photographer. Um, you know, I don't know if there was, whether she, she would have become one, but um, I don't know what the theories are on, on child prodigies. But the, the one child prodigy that there is documented in, in photography is Lartigue, um, who started when, when he was seven, I, I think, um, and it was, you know, very early on in, in photography, so it was actually quite, you know, difficult to use the camera, etc. But he, um, as a child, he was a great photographer, and probably maybe till he was around 20 or 23. And he, and he, I don't think he's still alive anymore, but um, he became, he continued to be a photographer and a painter, but he was never as good. As, as he was when he was a child. And he was great as a child. I think we'll end there on that wonderful note. Thank you so much. Thanks.